which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And may I have roll call, please? Mr. Carpenter? Here. Mr. Fitzer? Here. Mr. Colbert? Here. Mr. Cusera? Here. Mr. Nishai? Here. Ms. Redman? Here. Mr. Scott? Mr. Solomon? Here. Mr. Tinman? Here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> agenda item number four is approval of the agenda. Does anyone have any problems with the agenda as it stands? Anything that they want to change or anything? <clears throat> Seeing none, I will approve it as it is. And we'll move on to agenda item number five, which is the approval of the regular meeting minutes from March 12, 2024. And that'd be our last meeting. Uh, I'll move to approve our minutes from March 12, 2024. Support. Any changes, corrections? Seeing none, roll call, please. Mr. Nushai? Ms. Redman? Yes. Mr. Solomon? Yes. Mr. Tinlin? Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mr. Fitzer? Yes. Mr. Colber? Yes. Mr. Cusero? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item number six is public discussion. If anybody from the public wants to discuss anything, any items that are not on the agenda this evening, anything aside from what's on the standing agenda, anyone? No takers? And we'll close public discussion then. And we'll move on to agenda item number seven, which is a site plan review for 701 South Main Street. And Mr. Tangeri will start us out with, I believe. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to start with an apology for missing the first sentence in this. It got mostly gotten into the template or something. Um, this has absolutely nothing to do with the Black Lotus site. Um, so 401 South Main is, is down at the southern end of of uh, Clawson's portion of Main Street. It's owned BRD1. Uh, and this is a, uh, a building that's uh, been occupied by a dentist's office. Um, so it's located at the southeast corner of Bauman and Main Street. Um, and they're basically requesting some changes to the exterior that trigger site plan review under our ordinance. Um, so surrounding sites, uh, BRD1 and R2 to the north. There's commercial and single family over there. Uh, west across Main Street is BRD1. Uh, south is BRD1, and that's a um, daycare. And then east is R2, and that's single family. Um, they're proposing one exterior change to the building. It's already been completed. Uh, removal of a window to the left side of the door and introduction of a second window to the right side of the door on the street-facing facade. Um, the exist uh, old door is going to be replaced with an, a different style of door as well. Um, uh, they're not proposing any other changes to the site. Um, new window openings or doors are proposed uh, when they're proposed in a street-facing facade. PC review is triggered under Section 6.1 of our ordinance. Um, they're basically moving one window from one side of the front facade to the other. Um, doesn't actually affect the overall window coverage on the facade and the materials are matched masonry. The proposed change doesn't alter the building's compliance with the design standards of the BRD1 district, uh, which are included in the, uh, the letter there. Um, and uh, I don't have really any other comments otherwise, um, if there are any questions. <clears throat> I... Personally, I'm a tad surprised because <laughs> I went and looked at the building this morning and I'm not sure why they're here for a site plan approval on a project that's already completed. The windows have already been moved. The door was out this morning, so I'm assuming it's in the process of being replaced. Mm -hmm. Aren't people supposed to come to us to get a site plan approval before they begin work? That is generally the course of action. If someone uh, commences work prior to doing that, then kind of the first... Uh, recourse is to have them come in and get it approved. And if it's not approved, well, then obviously there's changes that need to be made to the... Um, <clears throat> Did anyone from the city of Clawson tell them to go ahead with this? I cannot answer that question. <laughs> so I, I can definitely take some responsibility for this. Um, 
I think there was just some miscommunication on what constituted a site plan based on our ordinances. There was discussion on window coverage on the front facade, and if they were replacing the windows, if it was going to be the same size, that would be okay. Uh, obviously, the work that was done uh, moved the window from one side to the other. The window coverage slightly increased, um, and so they've they there's just miscommunication on what triggered the site plan. Uh, again. It, Typically, window work wouldn't, um, in some cities, it doesn't constitute a site plan. So In our city, it does. Exactly, it does. And, and you know, like I said, I'll, I'll take ownership for that. But, um, you know, they're here now to get approval of it. Um, if the Planning Commission denies it, I imagine that they'll make it to the way it was. Um, but in order to do things the right way, we wanted to bring them back in front of you. I, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I just hate doing things after the fact. This came up years ago. You guys can all remember the Church of Clawson. They tore off their entire facade, and it looked terrible for over a year before we got them to restore it. He was told at the time by someone at City Hall, I don't know who, but they, he was told, go ahead and tear your facade off. And then he found out that hey, that's not legal, it's not right. It took us over a year to get that building back in shape. Uh, if we go to Gus's Snug, no, not Gus's Snug, they, they're okay on there out there. Uh, Grand River, they came in with a request for a mural, which was already installed. And it's, it's beyond me why we're even here. Why, you, you out and do what you want to your building and then come in and ask for our approval after the fact? Grand River says, oh, if you don't like the mural, we'll paint over it. And the same as here. If we don't like the way the windows are moved, are we going to ask them to move the windows back? No, not likely. I just think that somebody's dropping the ball here. I mean, when it comes to the artwork, they didn't think that it triggered a site plan. They didn't reach out to anyone from the city. I don't know how to affect that going forward. I'm sure homeowners do things all the time, and we, we fix it down the road with our typical permitting process. Um, when it comes to this one, uh, I think I misunderstood what their intent was with the window size change, and I thought they were simply replacing them, didn't realize that they were doing it, so I, I misinterpreted their plans. So, like I said... Um, I certainly take ownership for that, and that's why they're here now is to get approval, and uh, unfortunately the work is done, um, but that's where we are today. I think it's kind of a no-brainer. We're going to approve something that's already completed for us. Uh, if we look at C&C bumping and painting, I mean, that building's under a lot of construction right now, and usually I thought <laughs> you buy a building in town, you come up with a plan of what you want to do with it, you come in front of planning, and you bounce it off them, what you want to put in there, how you want to handle it, how the windows look, everything else. I'm surprised they're doing so much construction now. Are they going to have their building complete when they come in for site plan? All they've been doing is tuck pointing. The brick has been very unsafe, and so they're just making it safe for when they get to the point. Uh, the site plan is submitted, and it'll be in front of the Planning Commission on the 9th. Um, but every other project that they're doing there is, is in compliance with our building permits, ordinances, and everything else. Okay, you, I think you can see my position. I want to stay on top of the things. I don't want them. Absolutely. I, I completely agree, and uh, that's why we didn't just say okay and move on with this. We want to bring it in front of the Planning Commission to make sure that, you know, you do have the ability to look at these plans and uh, approve them. Is it a step after? Uh, yes, and that's unfortunate. Um, and we're doing what we can to make sure it doesn't happen again. Hey, Nick, I have a question. If they're uh, doing these modifications, I'm assuming they're getting building permits, correct? Yes. So for a lessons learned activity, can there be somewhere on that form that someone actually signs from the city that meets all uh, planning and ordinance requirements? Is there anything on that document now? There's yeah. a final administrative There's control. some things that we're trying to work out to make sure these don't slip through the cracks. Um, and I think we'll, we've we've implemented some things to make sure it doesn't happen again. But in writing, right? You know, I love writing yes. and documents. Got right? it. So someone that looks at this saying, okay, we're going to issue this building permit, and it meets all the requirements, so it doesn't have, it doesn't have to be in front yes. of us. And if we could, can we change the before and before to before and after? Nice brickwork, by the way, on the building, but uh, yeah. on the actual uh, public records. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Actually, though. here, if you look at the pictures, yeah. you have before and before. I'm oh. assuming that's before and after. Yeah, definitely. Attention to detail. Yeah, we can update that in, okay. in the planning letter, for sure. I have really no problem with the changes. I think we would have approved it regardless. I don't know if anybody else has any feelings towards it. Uh, and at this point, I <coughs> look to a, for a motion to approve. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll make name. a motion to approve uh, the site plan for 701 South Main as Part presented. Motion support. Any questions? Any comments? Can I roll call, please? 
I'm sorry, I did not catch who gave that motion, who supported that? I, I gave motion. it. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Solomon? Yes. Mr. Tinlin? Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mr. Fitzer? Yes. Mr. Colbert? Yes. Mr. Cusera? Yes. Mr. Nushai? Yes. Ms. Redman? Yes. Thank you. Welcome to Glossom. <laughs> Agenda item number eight will be the planned unit development at 150 North Main Street on the corner of uh, N36 Lincoln. Joe, you want to start us again? Yeah, we'll come back. All right, so our letter has undergone some renovation itself. Um, after the uh, oversight on the RM2 standards there. Um, so those are all included in the letter now. Um, as a kind of refresher, northeast corner of Bowers and North Main, um, current PNC uh, property as well as one house um, that faces on to Lincoln. And they're proposing a multifamily uh, residential project as a PUD uh, on this site. It's uh, 1.15 acres, about 50,000 square feet. Um, the um, site is qualified for PUD, um, and we are at the Planning Commission recommendation stage. That's what's highlighted in the uh, process portion of the uh, memo there on page two. Uh, so Planning Commission makes a recommendation to Council uh, one way or another, and then Council has the final um, uh, vote on whether or not to approve the PUD. So we've got uh, 60 units and 88 rooms proposed. Um, 33 efficiency units, 40, uh, 22 one-bedroom units, and five two-bedroom units is how that breaks down. Um, the next table in the letter on pages four and five um, gives you the standards for uh, the underlying zoning, CC, um, and shows where there are deviations. And then in the next column, it's the requirements for RM2, which is, has been discussed, um, apply here uh, because we're doing multifamily in a PUD. Um, and then it shows where those deviate, where the plan deviates from those standards. Um, so we've got some setbacks um, for RM2. They meet the standards in CC, but uh, not in RM2. And then um, uh, the uh, lot coverage and unit composition also is where it deviates from RM2. And then um, uh, as far as the CC district, there's typically a minimum 15-foot uh, ground floor height, and uh, they're at 11 feet. Um, the uh, minimum unit sizes meet the uh, requirements of Section 4.3. Um, they've actually increased since the last version of the plan. Uh, they were a little smaller last time. Um, uh, kind of getting into the meat of things, parking, of course, has been a major topic of conversation in the past. Uh, they actually meet the parking requirements for the units that are proposed at this point. Uh, they are also providing eight public parking spaces along North Main. Uh, we're still noting that the curb should be bulbed to provide protection for those spaces, both to the north and south. Um, and the AEW letter agrees with that as well. <coughs> Excuse me. They're, they're providing eight parking spaces on Main Street? Yeah. My understanding is the city's providing parking space on the street. I don't think that accounts to their building, does it? Well, it doesn't count for their... It's, it's public parking, so it doesn't count toward the uh, uh, required parking for what the units. Account? Okay. But they've got the required parking for the units on the site. On site. Yeah, they've got 76 parking spaces on the and site, and there's 76 the, required. The parking on the street is city parking. It's not... Exactly, yeah. It's extra. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And there will be some along um, uh, Bowers as well, because there's like four driveways out of the current site that are being closed along Bowers. So people, cars will be able to park along Bowers there as well. Not overnight? Uh, 
not overnight, of course, but um, they will be able to park there during the day uh, along that portion of Bowers. <coughs> um, uh, other kind of, actually, I'm trying to kind of focus on the changes, but um, sure. and and deviations. Uh, so typically in the city center district, there's a uh, a liner use uh, that's required along the principal street frontage. Uh, they're asking for. Uh, uh, one of the reasons that we're looking at a PUD is that they don't, they are asking not to do that. Um, they have a small um, co working space along that frontage, but for the most part, it's, well, their lobby and then units. Um, uh, let's see, they've got the wall that's required now. Um, uh, early on, it had been talked about doing a fence there, but they've got the wall now. Um, they've, up to the number of trees provided to meet the requirements. Uh, they've adjusted the lighting to meet the requirements as well. They've provided some cut sheets and, and uh, um, some notes to uh, show how they're doing that. Uh, and then uh, for vehicular access, RM2 usually requires direct access to a principal street. Um, and they're going off onto Bowers and, and Lincoln um, as, as would be required in the, in the CC district. Um, and then uh, there's some notes about EV parking, but um, we weren't, I don't think we ever kind of came to a final um, uh, understanding of exactly what they're going to do, if they're just going to put in the uh, infrastructure, or if they're going to provide the uh, chargers, or, or uh, how exactly they're going to handle that. Uh, so at the end of the letter, there is a summary of all the uh, deviations from ordinance standards. Um, and um, that's, uh, I mean, that's everything that's, uh, that's not in line with the ordinance there. So um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask them. <laughs> Anyone? I think they do have a little presentation too, as well. So. Yeah. Shall we wait for their presentation first? Yeah. 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 I like that. Yeah. Let's, let's see what the applicant has to say. That's okay. Yeah. All right. Can everybody see this this board? No. So this is really just uh, a visual cue. I'm going to come back up to the mic. Let's make sure everyone can see it. This one that we just gave you. All right, Good evening. My name is Jason Krieger with Krieger Clad Architects, uh, 400 East Lincoln, Royal Oak. And I'm going to Walk you through our presentation tonight. Michael Khalil with ownership is here as well, in case there's questions that are directed towards ownership. Uh, we're going to focus on the changes, which Joe already took us through, which is great. Uh, we do have the full presentation from last time. I might touch on a few things, but this is, I think, our third time here, so I think everybody's pretty familiar with the project. And then I'll point to a couple of the changes on that board right there, because I can't really point on the screen up there, so we'll walk you through that. So. Uh, Klaus and Flats is the project. Everyone's familiar with that. The big, one of the big changes is we went down to 60 units. The rest of the stats are the same from last time. Next slide, please. We all know where the site is and recognize it. Well, I can't read this, but so uh, last time we were here, uh, we had 64 units, and now we're down to 60. The previous time we did increase the size, so the size, the average size is still about the same. The change is that we, we manipulated the floor plans in order to um, get the unit count down. We also increased the size of the amenity space, which I can show you guys. Uh, so we went from about, I think it was just over, just right around 2,000 to almost 4,000 square feet of amenity space, and I can actually point to it. This is what we had initially. And then we took more of the ground floor area. So now it's about a quarter of the facade, but that's one of our deviations is we're trying, we're seeking to deviate from the liner. There's still a 11-foot uh, high ceiling in there? 
That's correct, yeah. So we have 10 feet uh, that were planned. I, I think Joe read 11, 10, 11. That's, that's fine with us. It's not going to impact much for us. It might be a little bit nicer, so that's fine. Uh, some of the other changes that we presented last time that were major from the initial time when we came in here was we pulled the building back from the neighbors that are to the east, which are depicted there, which helped with the, the parking count. We added, we initially along the east, we had a vinyl fence, we turned it into embossed concrete, so it looks like brick. We ended up adding the bushes that we discussed last time along there, so we could do our brevity right next to the, to the embossed fence, or wall. We added the street trees along Main Street, and we added the remaining street trees along Lincoln. So what we were doing is we, we heard everybody when we were here and we reduced as many deviations as possible. And we got to the point where we feel like this is a great plan. So the parking, which was the big one, we're now parked on site. And as mentioned, we're uh, through this development providing more parking on the street for the public, which we think is definitely a bonus. Uh, next slide, please. This is the site plan, which I was just pointing at over here. It's the same configuration as we saw last time. You could circulate in off of Lincoln and Bowers. You could circulate it through the site. Our trash bin remains uh, along the east. There were some comments before about potentially adding retail. Uh, we would rather keep this all residential. And the reason why is uh, as soon as you start to add a commercial component, like retail, whatever, the trash gets you know, much more intense. Right? Even if you're taking it out a couple times a week, there's more food, it's just potential rodents, et cetera. And you have a retail use, it's pretty low intensity, and it's very easy to manage because they have management on site who could take care of how this is all being managed. Uh, next slide, please. So the deviations as mentioned, it's the height. It's 15 is required. Uh, that would be good if it was a commercial use. Uh, this is not, these amenities are for uh, the residents, uh, we have a uh, co-working space. I think that could be used by anybody, correct? So anybody can go in there. But you, you can get away with an 11-foot ceiling. You do not need a 15-foot uh, ceiling for that. In the mm -hmm. ordinance, we did read that um, the liner doesn't necessarily need to be retail or commercial, but it needs to be an activated space, like a gym, which was literally used. So we would place our gym up along Main Street. The, again, the only difference is instead of going all the way across, we're limiting it to the corner. We feel that it's a good place for it because that's the hallmark piece. It faces the downtown. We want that to be, you know, beautiful with the windows. And as you go north, it does quiet down. The activities to the south, that's where downtown is. And so we feel very good about having the residents along the street. Keep in mind, we did pull the building back. So there's a green buffer from Main Street to the building. So it does soften it for the folks who live there. So they're not right on the sidewalk. Next slide, please. Okay, I'll flip through some of these pretty quick because you all have already seen these, but these are our floor plans and elevations and some renderings. So I'll just, this is the ground floor. The orange represents uh, the amenity space. You can see it's, it's broader than what was once before. And then the other color boxes are the units uh, that we ended up moving around in order to make this work. Next slide, please. That's floor two. And then floor three, you can see the units change in shape and size because we tapered the building back in in order to meet the 10-foot setback. So those uh, penthouse balconies are going to be pretty amazing, actually. Next slide. And we have our elevations. And the renderings to show the elevations better, but all high-quality materials. We have metal siding up above. We have brick on most of the building. And then we're introducing some hardy plank and some of the... Uh, wall pieces that are between the windows, which is a cementitious material. The idea is that when they clad this, it's maintenance free. That's what they want. They're long-term holders, and we want this to be something that looks beautiful for a very, very long time. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide right here shows the proposed project, which is over on the left, compared to the rest of the downtown. So it's a photo match of the downtown area. Next slide. And then we have some renderings, which, again, you guys have seen now. This is your third time seeing them, at least, I think. I think right after this, we have a couple of typical interior shots that are interior photos of other projects that just depict the level of finish that you would see on the inside of this building. 
Thank you. We're, we're available for questions. Unless, did you want to add anything, Michael? So we're available for questions. <coughs> Any questions for the applicant? No discussion. I know there's eight uh, eight uh, proposals for deviation. Did you want to go uh, one by one, or just to keep it organized? I will. Uh, can I make a motion, Chair, and then we can go on the discussion? <coughs> sure. I make a motion to approve the PUD at seven at the one fifty North Main and thirty six Lincoln, and to move this PUD to Council for final approval. <coughs> we have a motion, but support. But we have support. Okay, can we just sit on that vote for a while? Of course. Yeah, discussion is, yeah. is open for discussion. Uh, we'll discuss them. <clears throat> we'll hold that in, in, in mind. Uh, any questions for the applicant right now? <clears throat> I, <clears throat> well, if, if we're going to go to a vote like that, I'll tell you what, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not thrilled personally. I'm, uh, <clears throat> on October 3rd, uh, you guys came in front of the city council and you got a commercial rehabilitation exemption for 10 years. <clears throat> I, I used to be on council. I wasn't on council this time. I would have voted against that. And it struck me as very odd that when they came in for that, <clears throat> I, as a councilman, would have said, can you give us, we'll give you five years or seven years. And you guys are very adamant. No, we want 10 years. So this building goes in, goes in place, you're paying the same taxes that you're paying right now for the next 10 years. So it's not bringing a lot of income to the city for a 10-year period. Am I correct on that? I think no. I am. Wasn't the property reassessed? Because I was a councilman that I'll take credit for, or not credit for having that tax abatement. But wasn't there going to be a reassessment of the property? For, no. from, my, from my understanding, for the 10, 10 years starting in... It, October, that the taxes stay the same as it would be the PNC building. Correct. It freezes the value of the property, and therefore the taxes remain the same. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we let you put up an apartment complex here, and we let you pay minimal taxes for a 10-year period. And I'm not seeing exactly what the city is getting in return so, uh, for that. If you don't, very gently, if I may have just a gentlest reminder, obviously this body... And I understand all your concerns. Right. I, I understand. But this body is a, a, a zoning body, so we need to properly be focused on the zoning issue before you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> on a PUD, plan unit development, uh, eligil <clears throat> eligibility criteria, and to be eligible for plan unit development approval, the applicant must demonstrate and planning commission and city council must find that the proposed development meets the following criteria. And the first one is recognizable and substantial benefit. And the planned unit development shall achieve a higher quality of development than would otherwise be achieved under conventional standards and shall result in a recognizable and substantial benefit to the community and to the ultimate users of the developed site. Personally, I think it's kind of debatable. I'm not exactly sure what what we as a city are seeing as a substantial benefit to us. Uh, sure, we're going to bring a lot of people into town. <clears throat> but by doing that, we're also going to bring a lot of traffic into town. We all know there's going to be a traffic problem with this thing. Uh, you have the uh, allotted number of parking spaces that we require. I got that. That's if just the people living there are. You, they don't have friends come over once in a while, cars hanging out, and the traffic is going to be horrendous, I think, coming in and out of there onto Main Street, especially if Main Street does get slowed down to one lane. <coughs> right now, <clears throat> I, I pull out of that intersection quite often from the side street onto uh, Main, and it's, it's difficult to do now because there is parking on the corner. You have to see past the parked cars but at least you have your option of two lanes to pull into. If you put parking on there, you're going to be pulling out of that into a live traffic lane. And it's, it's, going, to be, it's going to be a tough thing. So I, I have a difficulty with that. Uh, Want to go item by item? Just curious. Because I do have some same concerns with... Same concerns, yeah. You know, uh, the first recognizable and substantial benefit to the community. Do sure. we want to let them speak on that? I think there was a letter that was originally attached. I'm not sure if they feel like that's changed. Like the WeWork station that you guys have included, I don't know if we are verified if that was for the public 
or only for residents of the building, that would help further cement sure. whether they actually have yeah, that a would, benefit. That makes sense, yeah, if you want to approach it from that way, yeah. So I'm not sure, rather than us talking at you guys for a while and have to answer 20 things. <laughs> I understand one thing, you know, um, and not to go, but, you know, we could discuss the public benefit again. I know that is a question you have, uh, Chair, and, you know, um, is one, it's adding eight more parking spots that we're paying for as part of the development onto Main Street. And the biggest benefit I see, right, so currently by code, I the whole liner would have to be retail, which means restaurants and different things. Those items would bring a traffic level much higher than multifamily, right? For a 3,000 square foot restaurant, you need 60, 70 parking spaces. As we know, that's more spaces than we have for all 60 units for one restaurant. So we think going to multifamily is actually a lower use of parking and traffic than retail and restaurants, right? Because people would have to, if you have 10,000 square feet of retail, there are 8,000 square feet of retail. Each, each retail location is going to ask for 20, 30, 40 spots themselves, right? Because if you have a breakfast place and then a dinner spot or a restaurant, we all know that parking lot next door is already very heavily trafficked, you know, on Friday and Saturday night. So to add more retail there, we, to us, would cause a worse uh, effect on the city. So the multifamily is a low use for traffic when you look at it against other uses. Um, other public benefit is, you know, we will have a co-working space. I know a lot of the coffee shops are busy now, but that co-working space will be open to residents of the building as well as residents of Clawson who want to go and get coffee and then go, you know, sit on a Zoom. There'll be a conference table in there that they would be able to rent by the hour if they're, work from, you know, work from home and want to have a meeting. So we, all, we will have a little retail component to it in the building. Um, but again, we look at that as a low density traffic retail use, not a high density. Currently, by uh, code, we'd have to have all retail, which we think would exag exaggerate the problem of traffic and parking in the city. We've worked really hard to get our parking count to code, so there is no variance asked on, on that side of things. Uh, we also are adding a 10-year storm drain. Currently, there's no storm drain, uh, storm detention in the area. Um, as you guys heard at the last meeting we were at, the residents came and said, my basement floods, is this going to make it worse? And the answer is, no, it's not going to make it worse. And hopefully it helps, right? Because we'll have a detention basin on the, under that so water will flow and be able to flow into the sewer system without flooding basements and backing up, right? That's required on any development that goes there, though, I believe. Right. Yeah. Anything? I, yeah. We require those. Any new construction, that would be required. If, if like, let's say a new bank came in to occupy. It's they been empty for a would, year, so they'd still have to come in front uh, of us. But what I'm saying is they wouldn't have to go through and do that if, like, a bank was going in a permitted use. If they're redeveloping, making modifications, they'd have to make modifications to the site. So is, is it a requirement? I mean, uh, technically, if you want yes. to, but it's still an improvement to the site based on the condition that it is now. That's following a standard, but okay. The other item we uh, have discussed and do with other cities is we will allow, and I know I believe they spoke with fire and police to use it for training before demolition. So the fire and police can do different training exercises in the building, um, and if permitted in Clawson Police would like, they can also contact Oakland County SWAT, which also does this in some you know, situations. It being a bank can be a useful training aid for both police and fire prior to its demolition, um, which is another use we propose to the city to use, obviously free of charge for them to go away and use that prior to demolition. Um, you know, those public benefits, you know, we believe bringing to the city and, you know, obviously the project in itself is, you know, taking a building that, you know, like you've said, that's been vacant for so many years and, and bringing residents to the city that one day, you know, live there as a, a bartender, right, and then meet someone, have a family, and stay in Clawson and move in Clawson and build that base in Clawson. And, uh, we think it's a, a uh, great project, you know, for the city. And just going on the tax abatement, I, I understand the stress of the tax abatement. And the way we look at it, and to be dead honest with you, and exactly what I told city council, it's the only way we can make it financeable. Um, and 
you know, by the time construction starts, it's going to take 16 to 24 months to get that done. We're, all, we're going to be a year through that tax abatement before we even start construction, and another two years after that. And then we have a six-month to a year lease up, right? So our tax abatement is closer to a six-year tax abatement, to be honest, by the time this is complete. And then once that tax abatement is completed, right, and that 10 years is up, it will most likely be the highest paying taxpayer in the city of Clawson for the next 50 years thereafter. Um, and, and, and that's why that program was built. It was built to allow cities to give an incentive to developers to build something that couldn't be built without that incentive. And then once that 10 year gap is done, right, then at that point, now you have a building paying, you know, more taxes than it could have prior to. And, and you know, I understand the stress from a city perspective, but we're long-term holders. I have, we have no expectation to ever sell this. We will be residents of Clawson for the next 50 years. Um, and, and, and it's the same thing I told city council at the, at the, you know, at that meeting is we want to be here for the long run. We want to help develop the city. And when the city needs something, we'd love for them to pick up the phone and call us. And when, you know, we need something, we'd love to have that great relationship with the city. Um, but again, Realistically, from us, our tax abatement will be a five to six year tax abatement, and then thereafter it uncaps to its value for the next 30 or 40 years or 50 years, and as long as it's you know in use, being probably most likely one of, if not the highest taxpayer in the city. So, if we held our ground and demanded retail on the ground floor, would you walk away on this? I, I, I. To be honest with you, would have no choice. It's not fine. I can't get retailers not, to not, go in there. I understand from your I, point of view. I no, can, I, 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 yes, because I can't get retailers to lease a space and tell them they don't have any parking. Um, can I just make a point that commercial real estate is not, it's a very highly desired, I don't think we need to hinge our decision based upon whether, you know, what, what they decide to do business-wise. Um, representing that we somehow would have no other buyers is a misrepresentation. Um, so I, I just want to make that point. Um, but again, going on to the retail, like you said, you, you mentioned traffic and you mentioned parking. Adding retail, and you're in commercial, if you're in commercial real estate, you understand there's a bigger demand on retail for parking and traffic than there is for residential. And, you know, if that's the concern is traffic going onto the street, adding retail on that liner will make that a problem times two or three by adding retail on that liner. <clears throat> more, even more than that. So we, we don't have a traffic study for this, obviously, but we've been involved with several, and we just had one done on a project um, in Novi. I get that's Novi, this is Clawson, but um, we, when it compared to a retail uh, project versus multifamily, it was like 10 times, the trip generation. Because, because of the nature of the business. So it would be much quieter and much less congested if it were, I mean, I think the only thing that would be less than that would be a storage building or something like that because of even less trip generation. So it boils down to trip generation. And that's what we just saw in another project. Can I ask you, why did you guys pick Clawson? If you went uh, three quarters of a mile down the road here at Elmwood and Maine, there's been a big empty lot that's been there for a long time. That's Troy though. Mm -hmm. Now, is, are you here at Clawson because you think that we're going to be easier on this than, than building in Troy? Or do, yeah. is, I'm, I'm not the buyer, so is that a bad I would say because Clawson's great. <laughs> but <That's right>. so, <clears throat> that parcel is zoned for industrial use in Troy, so I, they couldn't put residential there. But you know, from the start, they were looking. From my understanding, is a place downtown where there's a, a successful existing downtown where there isn't a ton of residential use in the area, where their residents have amenities that can go and support our local businesses and, and not they want to generate something to compete with those and to make our parking congestion that we already have in downtown make it worse. So they're, yes, are they adding a residential component? They've, they've met the requirement that you've, as a body, have asked for to supply the parking on site. They've done that. And so if retail and commercial was added instead of that, the parking congestion that we have it would just get get worse. I mean, that's the way commercial works comparatively to residential. That's a city problem, too. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and really, which, that's what the, it's zoned for. So I don't want to have this conversation like it's a benefit when when it's actually, like, 
we're not here. <laughs> Can we move past that? I just don't feel like that's an informative conversation. Um, we all know there's a parking problem in town, and it's not going to get better. Yeah. Well, and and if you all remember, we've talked about it in the master plan, and we're working on something to allow on street parking on North Main Street, which will help with the parking problem in general. Right. That's, okay. That's important. Uh, uh, comment. Which cop? What are we talking about? Just the uh, commercial liner, or the? Oh, we're uh, talking benefit? about benefit, right? Or so, is, is the planning commission? Uh, is that was already vetted before, it, right? The, so. If we stay in our lanes as a planning commission, right, we're looking at the eight deviations requested, and it isn't the processes. This is going to be the final meeting, either we recommend or not, this this plan. Because it'll go to council whether we recommend it or not, or it would be another hearing. At this point, it would be recommended that the body makes a decision to either um, allow, recommend council approves or denies it at this point. Uh, so that's what's in front of you today. To Mr. Tinlin's point, though, retails just for, menu. for our understanding, whether we recommend yes or no, does it still go to city council? Yep, and they have the ability to approve or deny it, yes. Right, even if we say we don't recommend it. Mm -hmm. Technically it speaking, yes. To yeah. city? Okay. Yes. Right. They so can just over to understand how much exertion we should it have here. Either right? way, yes. Yes, okay. So well, I was hoping in supporting that motion so we can have the dialogue with all the commissioners, because for me, for example, the commercial liner, I know it increased more uh, traffic for the community. And uh, retail space and cost, I had a question whether what's the occupancy right now? as far as are we building too much of the retail space in, uh, in Klaus right now? Because we have the uh, only other PUD was the Ace Hardware Store, right? Yeah, the uh, entire site. Well, no, oh, I'm we sorry, that's not a PUD. Roth, that, Roth, okay. Oh. Yeah. It's right across the street um, on Roth. So Roth and North Main Street. You mean PUD or mixed use? Roth is a PUD. I know, but they, I'm they wondering why you're making in, a distinction between They put in PUD. some retail there. Yeah. They didn't have to, I don't believe, at yeah. that location. So I, I think this should be case-by-case -case basis, right? We're looking at this project. So they're asking for eight deviations, so the commissioners can either say, yes, we support it as a majority, or we don't, whether we vote at all. There's eight, according to this grid. Oh. Hmm. Unless my numbers are off, right, the grid down here? I believe right. that's correct. Yep. So again, but since we have a, a sitting body of eight commissioners and we all have di different opinions, different viewpoints, that's why I was hoping to spark this discussion. If anything, it will benefit the council as they make their decisions as well. Yeah, uh, just to add a point, because you made a, you asked a good question. I'm not sure if we had the answer to it. Occupancy rate, right? Because currently, I'm trying to think of today versus they want to be here for 50 years, and the downtown kind of stops at this location. And do we need? and want to expand it further is residential simply enough or is there an interest in you know having retail space having a market having something like that further north of the city we obviously have that east and west going for some some space so trying to think about not just today right getting ready getting rid of an eyesore and putting out what i think is a beautiful building yeah. but thinking about uh, use and well. exact data when it comes to um occupancy right now we don't have that but i mean if you you look in downtown and you stand there you'd recognize that there's a handful, if not more, businesses that are new than compared to five years ago, yeah. even 10 years ago. There's been a lot of turnover, and we've got a lot of great businesses in downtown right now that we don't want to lose. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a handful of vacant properties that's just green space right now that, you know, with more development going on, it would encourage those property owners to either do something on those sites or there'd be more generated interest because the property value is going up to purchase that property and do something there. If people want to stay on that track, uh, uh, just so I don't get lost and uh, it doesn't get thrown by the wayside. Um, <clears throat> looking at the prints, I was surprised last time we talked. The apartments on the ground floor were going to have walkouts. No, they don't. And on the second floor and the third floor, they have balconies. And I was surprised to understand that the balcony on the second floor is going to literally overhang the city sidewalk. Yep. That doesn't strike me as being correct. Uh, Joe. Yeah. It's what? It's within ordinance. It's within ordinance. Uh, no, there, it's one of our ordinance says that they're not supposed to um, be in line or in the way of a pedestrian right of way. Um, so I don't, I mean, I guess they're above it by, it just doesn't seem like a very good. Someone can take over the airspace a, a, above a city sidewalk. That just doesn't sound right to me. I mean, you could be dropping things on pedestrians there. Just 
it's a minor point, but it's something I'd like to get cleared up before we I mean, go further. Right, and that's only, I, I believe those come down to eight or nine feet. Um, I, I think it's like a two-foot overhang over the sidewalk. No, no, I, I thought that they said it was a six-foot overhang, but it was about eight or nine feet off the ground, which to me is not very tall at all either. Um, it's over 12. It's um, 12 feet? It's over 12, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you want to speak yeah. to the actual physical dimensions, and then I can talk about the balcony. Uh, they'd be about uh, 13, 14 feet up off the ground, because we, we have an 11-foot ceiling height, so then you have your structure in there. So, uh -huh. so at least two feet, so say 13 feet. And how big is the actual patio? That's well, if I remember right, I think they were eight feet wide, if I remember right, and I think they were five feet deep. I'm going off memory. I don't have it in front of me, sorry. Uh, but I believe that was the case. Uh, five feet maybe. deep, but the building's only, what, three foot off the property, off the sidewalk? Yeah, I believe so. I can go look over there really quick. Yeah, You'd have pretty close to a two foot over the setback. Uh, the regulation that governs balconies, the only one we have in our ordinance, um, says that balconies, oh, let's see. Um, Balconies may be added to facades above the first floor with the following conditions. Balconies shall not extend more than six feet from the building face, so they're at six feet. Materials shall be compatible with the building and be integrally designed. And then balconies shall not extend into a public right-of-way without approval of the building director and meeting Chapter 66 of the City Code, which is um, the title of that chapter is Street Sidewalks and Other Public uh, Places. And there are clearance requirements. Um, it's not the one, but otherwise there's not a whole lot. So it's left up to the discretion of the building inspector? That's what it says in the ordinance. That sounds a little loose. Well, I, I think what they're trying to do is make sure that it meets code, like building codes. Hmm. Yeah, and it's a, a very intense downtown use, so I don't, I mean, it would be different if it's somewhere that's not where traffic people walking is the main yeah. component of downtown, which is one of my big struggles with the commercial liner, and the fact that every time we've talked about it, you know, studios are, are not a highly desired um, real estate <laughs> from everything I could find. And we've only upped it from 28 to 33, but dropped every other one. Two beds went from 11 to 5, one beds 27 to 22. It, it, that's a great point. Like, can we ask them a little bit more about why they guys made that decision? Because it, it does seem like, based on the RM2 requirements, 10% efficiencies you guys have 55 which is big so but i'm just curious base is it parking or something understood else? so part of it is parking part of it and to be honest is our understanding throughout this whole process that there's only one that this is city center right and city center and rm2 conflict in multiple ways rm2 has no building height cc has a building height right so now you have two codes that you're both looking at that are conflicting in multiple ways uh which causes part of that issue the other part of it is we've seen um, in downtown areas, studios and one bedrooms are actually what least the most. Two bedrooms are usually with a couple or two roommates who live together. Um, in these downtown buildings that are being built like this, those are the most desirable units. And again, from that part of it, right, it, it, that's my responsibility as a developer to make sure I lease my units and can take care of my building and pay my mortgage and do all of that, right? So. Part of that responsibility is on me. But the other part is parking. Realistically, if I put a, all two bedrooms in there, I'd fit 20 units. And again, and I know you guys don't want to hear about it. It's just not financeable again. And that's really where it comes down to. This structure, again, we came here originally with 70 units and a 22 parking variation. Uh, we thought we could get that done. Um, we heard your comments. We came back with five spots as a variance and then you guys again said we want parking to be code um, and this is how we can make parking code and still make the deal work and again that's you know my um, struggle with this if we had a three acre lot and we could build townhome type styles and have more parking it would be great but what we've seen in a lot of developments 
is, you know, 10, 20 percent of the residents don't have cars, right? And they're commuting through either walking downtown to the coffee shop they work at or take an Uber or carpool with someone else, right? So we don't even think we'll use all our spots that we do have to code, to be honest with you. Um, but we got it to code, and that was our, our biggest goal was to make sure that burden on the city was to to get our parking to code and to go to your comment to to limit the already you know as you said it's congested downtown it can be congested again we think this use is the least congested if there was parking to the north of us right retail could possibly go on the other side right on the Bowers side or the, or the Lincoln side correct on the Lincoln side um, but people would have to park in that public lot to go to the retail over there you only have the spots in front I understand the idea of expanding the downtown but there's really nothing north of us and nothing that can really be developed north of us on that on the other side right maybe the other side becomes all retail and parking on the other side right it's all undeveloped there's also those you know small lots that can be three tenant you know retail in the city that are on those vacant lots in the city so we think by bringing in those residents those lots can then be de developed into uh you know a wing spot or a juice spot or whatever else because you have the resident density to fill up the other retail the downtown so as a as a whole we think that the project only benefits both the retail downtown and future development of retail downtown Any further discussion? Um, I just... Uh, Joan, what's that? For, for the DDA, th this is a good project for downtown. I don't know what variants we're talking about right now because I didn't think parking was one of them, or is it because you don't like one bedroom or studio apartments? But can I point out that all of the ACE units are rented out right now? Um, there are people that... I know we're a single-family home community, basically. But not everybody wants that. There are empty nesters. There are people that, for one reason, find themselves single or newly single that don't want a home and don't want to take care of one. There are young people that the trend is now for people, younger people, to look, where do I want to work? I want to work somewhere where I can walk and be where all the things are that I want, the coffee shop, going out to eat. They look for those things. A lot of people, younger people, don't even drive. So Uber, Lyft, or the way they don't have a car and don't want to, they can walk downtown and use the restaurants and go to the coffee shops. I think the work share space is something with everybody working at home. A lot of people now working at home don't have a place if they're at home. Kids are running around. Maybe they like to have a meeting and not have to have it at a coffee shop. A work share space is a great thing. In fact, many years ago, we talked to PNC about leasing out their second floor for that very use. So, and even more now since COVID, it's something that's even more important. Another thing we did find when COVID hit, we have workers in town, in the downtown, that when mass transit wasn't working, when the buses weren't working, they couldn't get to work because they didn't have a car. So living downtown makes perfect sense. And again, can I point out that what was just built is leased out. So there is a market for it. So thank you. Um, Chair, since we've had a lot of people come up and talk, I wondered if we could open it up for public comment. So just to give everybody, if there, if there are people within the audience mm, that Anyone from public want to speak? <clears throat> I'll give you three or four minutes. Hello, Nate Hara from uh, 413 Park. Um, I am grateful for everyone who's put so much effort into this. I know it's a, a contentious issue. And, uh, the developer has certainly put a lot of effort into the what are now three revisions, I think. Um, you know, I'm just coming from the perspective of, of uh, people who, who've lived in Clawson for a long time and uh, uh, like its unique character. and. Uh, it's hard to define exactly what makes Clawson Clawson sometimes. It's easy to say we're the, the big city or the little city with the big heart. It's, it's very hard to say why it's like that. Um, and uh, it's very progressive, I think, to say the kinds of, point out the kinds of things that Joan talked about where 
uh, there's, there's seemingly no reason to worry about congestion or traffic and every reason to believe that we're not going to be driving in a few years. Um, but I, I guess I don't see that as a, as a goal or I don't see that as a, as a, a given, and it's certainly not a given in the short term. Um, so I, I've talked to a lot of residents who live on Lincoln who are very concerned about the congestion this project will bring to their neighborhood. Um, as a consequence, and uh, they were just, they like the idea of this. They like the, they're open to there being an apartment. It's just the density of it is, is very, very high. And from my point of view, the ordinances that we have pr that protected Claussen and preserved its character all this time were not one ordinance or, or that ordinance. It was a combination of ordinances working together that you know, allowed Claussen to, to thrive. And uh, I hear what is being said that the parking is not an issue anymore, but it's, it's a different thing altogether when you ignore the 10% efficiency requirement. When you allow that many efficiencies in one spot, the one bedroom or one parking spot per efficiency, one and a half per one bedroom, it really is a different math. And it basically is assuming that everybody is single and no one has roommates and the parking is okay. But if even 50% of the units have a, a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend living with them that does, in their example, an unusual circumstance, has to drive outside of Clawson to get to their job, um, we don't have a lot of businesses in Clawson. Um, so we, we probably are expecting most of these people to go drive to their jobs. If even half of the residents have to go to have a, a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a roommate, there's like 14 spots missing just for them and no accommodation for their visitors um, or the employees of the apartment complex. So it is, it is, it is definitely uh, per the standard, um, but because of the 55% the, the efficiency and the, the density of the units that is being crammed into what would otherwise per code be a commercial liner, it's, it's very, very congested. And um, I get the idea that people want congestion, like they want to motivate people f to get out of driving because um, they don't like driving and they don't like cars and, and that's one point of view. But there's a lot of us that need our car and need to be able to efficiently get through and I think there's a lot of businesses that are depending on Clawson being honestly an easy to navigate city where you can get to the restaurant, you can get to Noble Fish and you can get in and get out and go quickly and get home and come back. Like it's not daunting to try to travel through Clawson right now. But if you congest it and if you tie up the streets so much with people getting in and parallel parking in and out of lanes, like is proposed on not only Main Street, but also now, um, uh, I'm sorry, the road escapes me, Bowers. Um, yeah, it's going to be so congested in there. Look at the photograph in, in Joe Tangeri's site plan package and you just see traffic already backing up on Bowers. Um, so it's, it's aggressive and I respectfully, if it happens, it happens and, and your decision is obviously a team and a board, but if it could be somehow a little more conservative and a little more, with a little more safety factor for traffic conditions and less density of units, um, while by the way, Maybe escalating and elevating Claussen's standard, you know, a per perception of standard. Yes, it's no doubt there's a bigger market for people who can only afford an efficiency than there are for people who could afford a larger one. But it, it should be our goal to elevate our city and our community standards and the, the quality of, of uh, residences that we have in our city. So thank you all so much for serving and listening to me and giving me the chance to say these things. Thank you. Any further uh, comments? Um, well, I'll just make another. We close the public hearing. Oh. Close the public hearing. Closed. Thank you. Public hearing is closed. If you want to. <laughs> um, so on the commercial, um, you know, I, I think, and I've listened to lots of meetings where, you know, the commercial aspects, and I don't even know if I should talk about it again, I don't want to open it back up, but uh, people come to downtown and hopefully they're going to many places, they're not only parking there for that use, there's a shared use of parking, a flow of that traffic, so um, I, I don't really see that component <laughs> of commercial liner removed as a benefit. 
Um, I, I do think that we're taking on more than what we're asking from them in the whole essence of a PUD is to take two uses, mix them together, and provide us as a city with a benefit that we would be better off with than otherwise. Um, so I, I, I will not be supporting. <clears throat> There's uh, no further comment. Uh, Actually, I did have a, more of a question. I know Joe mentioned that the units above ACE was all, all leased or rented out. Are, are they all efficiency units? What, what types of, I'm not familiar with that building. I mean, I'm familiar with the building itself, but I'm not familiar with what, what types of spaces we're talking about. If I can have a minute, I can probably tell you what the unit mix is. Okay. I believe that was a PUD as well. No, right. No, it wasn't a PUD? Okay. Joe can look up the exact numbers because I don't remember, but there's efficiency. There's one bedroom and there's a couple, two bedrooms. Okay. Thank you. So I just have a question on protocol. Since we have a motion standing, uh, since we have that balcony question, uh, does that need to be incorporated? You know how we do business, uh, or I mean the uh, plan approval we always do, if uh, that needs to be addressed, or is that just good, something that's going to be handled at the council level? Uh, we don't approve the plan itself right yeah. now, though. Yeah, I no, don't just think, recommendation. Right? But how do we capture like, the balcony over the sidewalk? Oh, I, I think they'll still have to. If it is approved, yeah. from my understanding, maybe I'm wrong. They still would have to come back for approval of the site plan. Is that right, Joe, or no? Mm, I don't believe so. They've got a full site plan here, and they're seeking concurrent approval. So oh. the, the last PUD, they didn't have their whole thing when they got their PUD approval. So when this plan gets approved, it goes straight into the development agreement. So in the motion on the table is one without giving them any type of variance? or So that... Well, Usually I think it, they come back. For I think those it things. would be to approve as presented. If I no. um, correct me if I'm wrong. Correct. Okay. Um, okay. Just may I just say one? Sure. I didn't know if that was close, but regarding the balconies, just to kind of just touch on that. Typically, you're right. Typically, you're not always allowed to overhang a, a balcony over a, a property line. Uh, it, what I've found is that in some communities, like in Detroit, we've done it, uh, in Ferndale, we're, we're doing it, but we're actually hanging the whole building. What happens is it, it boils down to, and I would suspect it would happen here as well, the city engineering department's going to review this, and if there's anything there where they're going to need to get equipment in, then that's going to be, a, that, I think that's why it punts to the building official, is to make sure that it's clear. So I think it's, it's more about working in the right of way and things of that nature. So we, we've done this before, but there are, I think, there are mechanisms typically that help safeguard that. If there is a problem, I would think it would then come to us. So. I'm not mm -hmm. worried about equipment coming and going. I'm worried about people drop, dropping a can sure. of beer on somebody's head. Yeah, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> what my concern is. Absolutely. That's what I touch on. That. And I don't know that we can specify that if we just simply approve this as is without putting it as a tagline that, you know, we don't like that. Uh, this says, after public uh, hearing, the Planning Commission makes a recommendation of approval or denial to the City Council. In front of me, I have a motion to make a uh, move to recommend the City Council approve the proposed plan and unit development. I believe that's what Mr. Krakenshai said. And I have a second on that. Yes. Yes. And if we have no further comments, uh, I'll take a roll call then. Mr. Tenlin? Support. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mr. Fitzer? Yes. Mr. Colbert? Yes. Mr. Cusera? No. Mr. Nushai? Yes. Ms. Redman? No. Mr. Solomon? No. Right. Thank you. Motion passes. Uh, five to three. Yes, five to three. Congratulations. Thank you. And good luck with City Council. <laughs> Okay, we move on to agenda item number nine is discussion of the draft sustainability master plan chapter.
sorry, I, I must have missed where you moved us on to the next. Oh, okay. I was like, we no, gonna no, move on. To this? So I didn't want to like jump in before you the you chair were just here moved to the meeting along. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you were looking for something. I was yeah. trying not to usurp the chair. <laughs> Okay, all right. Um, so the other thing that we have uh, is the sustainability chapter draft for the master plan. So the sustainability committee, known as Clawson Naturally, has been working on this uh, for months now. Um, as I'm sure uh, most of you are aware, a couple of you I don't think were here when it happened, um, but most of you are aware that um, the... Clause and Naturally uh, Committee, which was established by the Planning Commission a few years ago, uh, created a sustainability framework, and that was accepted by uh, the Planning Commission uh, and Council, um, I want to say la early last year, but I feel like my sense of time has really like collapsed uh, in the last couple of years, so it might have been two years ago, but I think it was last year. Um, and what that did is it set up a framework for us to uh, sort of uh, develop action items that could be taken to uh, advance the city's sustainability goals that were established as part of that framework. And that's what this draft chapter does, is it, it looks back at the framework. What we did is we had these four, um, if you were on page... Um, 32 of the uh, the chapter. It's not, I don't know exactly what page it is of the packet, but it's page 32 of the chapter. Um, it says the framework at the top. So we had these, uh, these eight focus areas that were established up front. Um, and when we did the framework, we wound up with 14 goals. And what we did as part of the development of this chapter is we consolidated some of those goals and we wound up with eight goals, each of which matches one of the focus areas uh, of the framework. So we have water, energy, waste, transportation, land use and community design, emergency preparedness, social sustainability, and economic sustainability are all of our, our focus areas, and each of the goals ties to one of those focus areas. Um, we've provided some definitions of sustainability and resiliency, and those are carried forward from that adopted framework, uh, so there's no change there. And then from, from, from there, we talk a little bit about um, uh, what we heard from from residents and we actually have a little bit more summarizing to do of that because we had the uh, survey uh, remain open for a little longer um, so we've got um, some more of that to uh, to summarize and update but um, that'll we can show that to you once we've got it all ready because uh, the the survey is um, I was about to close, so, um, but anyway, one of the main thing we had people doing on the survey was kind of prioritizing what, which of these goals were most important to them. So water, uh, ro <laughs> water rose to the top. Um, <laughs> of course. I, I actually really was not intending to use that construction, but, um, uh, unfortunately that's where I landed. So, um, and, and I think that it's a very salient issue for a lot of people because they've seen the storm drain back up. They've seen water in their basement. They've seen their backyard have a puddle in it. Uh, so it's very, very important to a lot of people uh, that this is something that the city addresses. So we develop some objectives under each of these, uh, these focus area goals. So reduce the likelihood of flooding due to extreme precipitation events is kind of our top line for water. Um, and then the <coughs> objectives underneath, we have some high priority, medium priority, and low priority, and that's based on the feedback that we heard. And if any of those need to move from one category to another based on the, the other results that have come in, we certainly will do that. Um, and I'm not going to go, like, objective by objective because we'd be here all night. But if anybody has any that they want to call out or ask a question about, uh, definitely feel free to speak up. Just raise your hand, and I'll stop, and we can address it. Go ahead. No. 
if, if I recall from the sustainability framework, water mm-hmm. was um, in reference to water and wastewater in terms of water quality, water mains, uh, mm-hmm. water treatment, not flooding and green infrastructure. I know that was talked about, but not in the sense of water. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to understand where water quality, water mains, infrastructure, where that went to. Sure. Um, just making notes here on all the questions that get asked. So if I take a pause to type, that's what I'm doing. Um, I'm, not, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that this is not important. I'm just, this is not <laughs> right, what was right. talked about before. No, I understand. Um, yeah, uh, that kind of, I guess, fell below flooding um, as we were uh, developing this framework. If you'd like to bring some of that back, we can incorporate it into this. We could also expand the goal to, uh, to talk about that as well. Um, I think that that's a reasonable um, thing to do. Um, And are also uh, one of the other things is that our, as far as like water mains and maintenance and things, um, that's really falling under the goal area of our infrastructure chapter as well. So some of that doesn't appear here because it's actually located elsewhere in the plan. Um, uh, but as far as water quality is concerned, I do think that we can bring that back into this uh, into this goal. Uh, I was just curious where the conversation, you know, led to and how we were, how we landed with this. If if, if there was some right. justification or reasoning behind it all, then it, yeah, just well, be good to know, understand really, how we landed here. As far as the um, uh, uh, the the emphasis on flooding and um, how to mitigate that in the future, that that is a direct response to what we heard from from the people who answered our surveys is that was just the the issue that that was far and away kind of the the most captured issue in the responses that we had from from our residents is that they were very focused on not having flooding problems in the future if at all possible yeah, um, just if i could expand on it as part of you know this body that put together um what you're seeing so to the point that was already made, I think a lot of the conversation when I had brought that back up when we started the actual action planning was it's covered elsewhere, right? It, it becomes a bigger piece that this body, we, we, like, we went through the survey results and this was the main focus and where the, a lot of the survey comments talked more about flooding over quality of water or where wastewater go, goes, it, it comes back up through the sewer. That's the one point. But if it was when I actually brought up the the clean drinking water issue, that was one that might have got left off, Joe, in my opinion, because I <laughs> know in our jam board I had included it somewhere in this. So sure. I did miss the past few meetings when I had the birth of my child. So I don't I didn't get a chance <laughs> to have like direct say in this final one. But I know in talking just kind of more generally about um, those uh, other issues they just felt like they were covered elsewhere within the, the master plan okay well that, that, that makes sense I, I think i guess as the master plan conversations sure. and the goals discussions kind of continue on it's something that we just need to keep in mind so that we don't have redundant goals oh, right yeah we, we we definitely wanted to make sure that we weren't we didn't have goals that were stepping on each other so um yeah the the um and actually a few of the objectives here um sort of obliquely address water quality as far as um, <laughs> filtering water that's going back into the system. But um, uh, yeah, when we get to, when we bring you the infrastructure goals, I think we'll be able to assess whether or not we've covered all the bases and whether or not we need to add anything as far as that's concerned. Okay. Thank you for the question. That, that was a really excellent question. So, um with the survey, who did you guys as a group come up with the questions and <coughs> when you yeah the uh, well the um, the prompts for the questions were developed uh, by the the committee with our help, and um, we were asking people to prioritize you know what what came out of the framework uh, so uh-huh. um, and the, uh, the framework of course had a whole bunch of public input that fed into it as well so we kind of, that was all developed 
on the basis of what we heard from from residents. Um, but really, that makes sense. I think there was a survey for the framework. There Years was a past. survey for the framework? Okay, because yeah, I was yeah. like, wait, yeah. how did we... develop the overall topics, and then okay. I think the most recent survey was based on the framework, the framework survey and, and how we built that. Exactly. We started to put, okay, what are specific action items that would address the concerns we're hearing? And then the team there had um, just basically done like a sliding scale, kind of like we had in our survey mm -hmm. for the master plan update yeah. on do you agree, you know, and level of agree, disagree okay. in terms of importance. I think. Right. I don't remember if it was one to ten scale. I can't remember how you guys. Uh, I think it was one to seven, yeah. Yeah. Um, so. But yeah, exactly. And that's how we wound up with the priority ranking of the objectives. Okay. That's focus one, two, three, four. Those, these are just, that's not how you numbered these, though, right? You're talking about the survey results, right? Uh, well, that's how these priorities got identified. We allowed people to tell us what was most important to them. So the things that are listed on, as high priorities, those are the things that we heard from the most okay. people were very important to them. And then they're in kind of a rough order of this was the most important and then the next three. And then there's kind of a drop to the medium priorities and a drop to the low priority items. And that's how all of them are organized. Um, And then you know, on the next couple of pages, we get into the actual action items. Here are the actions you could take. We've got a couple of little benchmark items in there um, just from other communities. Here's how, for instance, Eastern Market utilized a bioswale. Um, but uh, all these uh, action items were workshopped with the group. Um, and the public uh, generally was also invited to give um, uh, some, some ideas on this as well. We had, uh, it's called a jam board, um, and it's basically a little like a digital whiteboard or um, like bulletin board, and you put post-it notes on it with your, your suggestions, and that was used to kind of generate these Ideas and of course a lot of it was you know research that we did on okay how would we address this and then we made a suggestion, but um, we have a, a mailing list of people who at various points since its establishment have expressed interest in the sustainability uh, committee and all of those people were uh, invited to give comments uh, and of course these are all public meetings too so anybody who um, wanted to could drop in and uh, attend the meeting. Uh, they're all digital meetings. So um, I don't know exactly the number of suggestions that we got from, from folks who weren't directly on the committee, but it was, it was open for that, and it was promoted that way. Can, wh what is the natural green infrastructure? Did you guys like define those things in protecting existing natural green infrastructure? Does that mean like green spaces and... Is that a silly question? I don't know. But um, uh, oh, you're talking about uh, number four under high priority? Yes. Uh, that basically would be um, places where you have undisturbed uh, uh, undisturbed ground, basically, um, or places that aren't already paved, basically. Um, okay. This is kind of the main thing we're looking at there. Yeah, Joe, should should the Planning Commission consider this a final, or is this still open for edits? Because Oh, it's still open for edits, certainly. Yeah, I think that's yeah. important to note. Like, yeah. Right. We had a good amount of survey responses. We had a smaller committee than I would have liked to see on a regular yeah, basis. Same, absolutely. So, yeah. I mean, I would welcome more feedback to this final document, not all the kind of back leg, all the hard work's done, you know, in terms of kind of gathering it and putting yeah. ideas together and then putting it in a priority list. I think... My main suggestion was, when we met maybe two months ago, was we have too many goals, right? So I already right. tried to thin out. We were at 13. <laughs> we went to eight goals. Eight's a lot more like topics, But now we have yeah. all these action items, which are still, in my opinion, there's a ton of them, right? And my biggest fear is when you have too many objectives, too many action items, and nothing gets done. So I personally would welcome feedback on how to thin this out to what is most relevant 
to well, Oh, sorry. I, I thought you were done. Well, I, I was just curious. I mean, I know we know what some cog is, but I'm, I was curious, like, just looking through these, uh, how well many residents might know, yeah. you know, the importance of SEMCOG and, or even the GLWA, or I'm probably yeah. the wrong acronyms, um, but, like, how important it is for us as a community to work with them on things like the drainage yeah. and, um, you know, combined sewer systems. Right. So uh, we, we do actually uh, expand all the acronyms at the bottom of the, uh, uh, the table. Uh, but as far as what each of these does, what we've been doing recently with our master plans and master plan updates, we've actually been providing a glossary uh, so that, you know, okay, well, SEMCOG, I guess, stands for Southeast Michigan Council of Governments, says, you know, average person reading this document. Well, if they go to the glossary, they can actually understand what SEMCOG is from, from looking at that uh, because it'll, it'll explain it. And if you feel like there's anything that's confusing or not explained, uh, you know, when we're looking at more of a, a complete plan draft, then we can always add that. So if we, if we feel like even there needs to be a paragraph here that talks about the importance of whoever... Uh, as far as a, a partnership is concerned, we can, we can certainly do that. Yeah, I was just curious because some, uh, you know, in terms of responding, I would I would be curious to know if residents knew that they had more leverage or gave us more leverage funding for certain aspects of um, things we sure. want to accomplish if they would have voted higher or lower or just if they knew. Because um, I don't think the average... I guess I shouldn't say that. I don't know how many people are familiar with SEMCOG or even the water Right. Well, that wouldn't have been in the system. questions, but um, that's that's just the action items where we're actually trying to identify the supporting partners. But we wouldn't oh. have we wouldn't have referenced SEMCOG in a question to, you wouldn't have. to okay. the general public. No. Oh, okay. We talked in more general um, everyday terms in the in the surveys that were administered. Okay. So, Joe, I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. So where would it give the feedback to you, or would it give it back to the Sustainability Committee for this document? Uh, well, you can give it to, to us. Okay. Um, and if there's major things, we can take it to the Sustainability right. Committee. If there's small cleanup, we can probably make that small cleanup. But, um, yeah, if there are major things, we can And the timing the around this, one week, two weeks, a month for feedback? Oh, for feedback, um, a couple of weeks, probably okay. between now and the next meeting, I think is when we'd like okay. to have that. And... Um, then I would say that um, if there's a need to go back to the committee, we can get that scheduled um, and uh, um, run things by them. With respect to this draft plan, um, it, I know there's opportunity to update and revise, but, you know, is there, you know, to, you know, um, Aaron's question, earlier question about what's green infrastructure, are, are we, are there, is there going to be narrative to this portion of the report, to this master plan, so that to provide clarification of what all sure. these things mean? Yeah, some of that actually will come from the, the framework itself, because it's, it's explained a little more thoroughly there. Um, but yes, we actually absolutely can flesh things out with more narrative, um, just to, uh, uh, or just that kind of glossary kind of content that helps people understand what are we talking about when we talk about green infrastructure. Um. And you guys went through this already as a, com a sustainability community, right? Yes. Did you have an overall um, takeaway that you want to share with us about things, anything that stands out or anything that is something... I don't know. Were you there at those, Josh, or no? Um, so I missed the last maybe one or two. Okay. Uh, my main goal was as kind of an appendix or, you know, as portion of our master plan, it gets lengthy mm -hmm. and there is a lot of objectives. And like I said earlier, my biggest fear is when you have too many objectives and nothing gets done. But I think it's a really good resource for somebody who wants to take action, right? I really appreciate the hard work that I know Stephanie and those guys did to talk about funding sources and potential supporting partners. We did our best to talk about action items which based on feedback and there was a couple of people within the committee that had been part of, you know, the Royal Oak or the Oakland sustainability, so kind of broader groups. So I appreciate a lot of their, their input. Mm -hmm. um, they were further along in their own green journey than I am in terms of having, you know, <laughs> solar panels and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, my main 
takeaway is that this is, you know, a, a large action plan that I would love to kind of hone in further with this body based on, you know, you guys all have your own perspectives, but also hear from community members all the time. We did our best to kind of open up to the general public, and I think we got pretty good responses. Yeah. Um, but in terms of seeing the final deliverable, I don't know if we have a workshop, Joe, or anything else planned to show this to the public, because I think this oh, final yeah, document there will, there is, will be more, yeah. It's great. It's just, yeah. again, it's still potentially a little bulky. Mm -hmm. um, but I, as a reference for future, I think this is, this yeah, is I, very beneficial. I think if we were looking to whittle away at, at anything, what we might consider doing is um, focusing in the chapter on kind of like the principal action items and objectives and then taking what like the maybe the lower priority items and uh, uh, action items that are associated with them and placing them in an appendix so that mm -hmm. we don't lose them right and we have them to fall back on if we make progress on the other things um but uh then you can kind of maybe focus the chapter in a little bit more on the high level or the the high priority stuff yeah um, i mean personally i mean this is i'm one person of this whole committee but i would love to see this trended over 20 years right like what action did we actually take how do we feel you know, in terms of the, just kind of how we do the master plan, right? Kind of red, yellow, green. Have we made, yeah, you know, well, any progress against some of these things? Are some less relevant now than we thought they might have been five years ago, ten years ago, right? So if EVs sure. aren't the future, right. you know, do we need yeah. to focus as much in that section? Things like that. Did you guys get a sense? Like some of these okay. seem they can be very much open to interpretation. Were there areas where people can? put in there a few words, kind of like we had just, okay, for example, support residents and businesses following a disaster to recover. Like maybe a lot of people were thinking of the flood of 14 or, you know, things like that, but that could mean a lot of different things to a lot of people. So what drives your action item there? Did you get specific feedback? N not necessarily. I'm just using that as an example um, for what drives your action items and the response um, well, in terms of the action items themselves, that's really, you know, that came after the survey where we're talking about, all right, here's what people identified as high priorities in terms of the objectives that we're looking at. Uh -huh. So how would we go about accomplishing that? Who are the partners that we would reach out to? What are the potential funding sources to make progress toward that objective that people identified as being high priority? Um, you know, I mean... That that's kind of where the 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 rubber hits the road, right? Is people understand that they want to increase safety at a crosswalk, but they don't have the professional tools to understand exactly what you might do at that crosswalk that would increase safety. So that's our job is to say, well, here are some things that would increase safety there, and here is who would take the lead on that, here's how you would fund that, and here are some potential supporting partners who would go about doing that. And that's not really something that we necessarily would take to people and say, you know, do you think we should partner with SEMCOG to yeah, add more? Yeah, I was more, just saying, well, you know, our, you know, the response, I'll follow back on my last one, disaster recover, following a disaster to recover quick, like I... <coughs> Are they looking for money? Are they looking for uh, just uh, a name of resources? Are they, what kind of disaster? Are we talking about um, a tornado? Are we talking about? Talk about like stuff like, you know, the Hunter Community Center being open as a cooling area. Exactly, okay. right. So there was some specific examples we discussed that I don't know if we need to further incorporate into this, right. you know, action planning. Yeah, but, some, um, some, of it, some of that is in here. And a then lot of it was, I mean, there's kind of two components, right? You just talked about how do we take action as, you know, a government body, right, to be able to make right. progress. But a lot of it you'll notice is like awareness mm -hmm. and, and teaching right. people what yeah. resources are out there, you know, exactly. how, how we could do more right and i think whether that's you know incorporating more information at the library i don't know if we have like specific action items in those but i know it, a lot of it was kind of just being more clear with the citizens and resources that are available having kind of options to join you know let's talk about what you can do to 
you know, have a green garden or something that may right. you know, cause, you know, less flooding in your area, things like that. So Well, exactly. yeah, that would be a fun little workshop, yep. almost like, yeah. But, yeah, um, I mean, it is basically kind of on us to interpret and say, all right, here are the things that can be done to to support progress on these objectives. And, you know, we don't, we just, we just don't expect people to have the resources necessarily to, to, to identify those things for us, you know, and, and, and there are a lot of different disasters that could happen. So we've got to kind of think about them all. And, um, the, the goal, the objective is more general because it's, we're really trying to, to do contingency planning. Mm -hmm. And then under the action items, we're trying to get a little more specific about, well, in this case, here's something that we could do to <coughs> relieve pressure on people. In this case, here's something else we could do to relieve pressure on people. Um, what, do you guys plan to have a list of objectives or goals when when coming to the to come to the planning commission in terms of ordinance or zoning or um some of this would ultimately speak to some ordinances uh this is this plan doesn't have as much focus on the ordinance amendments as some of the other ones will uh but some of this would speak to some uh, well and who determines amendments. that and what what who does the committee come forward and say we? Well, I mean, that's I know really, it's not we formal. have to identify that as um, a planning commission. Uh, uh, us as a consultant, to, we you have to do. basically say here are the ones that speak to zoning, and we we can put those aside and take them to you. Um, and then there's there's other ones that just obviously have no zoning component, so that's going to be handed to city administration and there's going to need to be work on the advocacy items and things and planning commission might be involved in some of that or the, the sustainability committee itself if we can set up a long sustainable version of the sustainability committee might also take some initiative on those things as well um so there's going to be a, a kind of a, a diversity of different um lead bodies at this plan ultimately is handed down to um but yeah some of it will Joe, will come to zoning the, the action items are they i know i noticed they're numbered is this meant to be sequential or prioritized or uh we really really we were just thinking that it would be easier to be able to refer if we had to to goals to action item six or action item nine okay. rather than like copying the whole uh, thing i i noticed under the transportation action action items um uh, what, the traffic and safety board's not m mentioned or referenced at, at all. I mean, maybe I'm missing it. There's a lot of uh, partners listed, but what what are their what is their role in, in any of these action items, or do they have a role? Uh, yeah, most likely they're going to have a role in a few of them. Um, that's a board that actually it's it's funny. I've been working here for a while, and it's a board that I've really only become familiar with very recently. Um, <laughs> But um, yes, the Traffic and Safety Board is a partner that I don't think was captured uh, when when this was completed, but they are definitely going to be part of uh, some of these action items and we'll add them in there. Um, and I think they probably don't, they're probably not necessarily a lead body um, on most of them, but they are a supporting partner and they're something, somebody that will have to run some of these things through. Um, because they ultimately have some uh, uh, authorization authority. Regarding the lead bodies under transportation, I noticed that the, the road commission is listed as a lead body for a number of these action items. I'm curious on how that ended up being when the road commission doesn't have jurisdiction over the majority of the roads in the city. Yeah, Unless we're talking about speed bumps on Maple. It's actually DPW um, that should be under number one there. Okay. Um, and then I know, you know, I saw it again on the completing the road diet. I know it wasn't the DDA or somebody else taught, um, initiating a road diet study? Yes, the DDA uh, should be listed there as one of the lead bodies. Our, uh, it's actually SEMCOG, really, that's working on 14 Mile. And then Main Street is all city. Um, you, 
you, you, you just threw me off. I, I, I got a little anxious about more work. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions or comments at this time? Um, if there aren't, people can obviously spend time with this and kind of go through what they're seeing in here and um, you know, let us know what you think. Um, we're going to have a uh, master plan item on the agenda next uh, meeting, and there will be more material, but we can set aside some time uh, to discuss <laughs> any other thoughts you might have on this. Uh, and then. Um, get some uh, feedback to the committee uh, and see what else needs to be done at that point. And, and Joe, is the stand, st sustainability survey still open until March 31st? I believe so, right? right. Okay. Right. Yep. And you guys, is this going to um, cycle through? Did you already say this? Sorry if you did. Uh, five years or whatever. Is it five years that... Do you guys plan to review it much like we do on our master plan every, you know, yeah, so five, seven years? Or? A couple things about that. Uh, yes, it is, it's part of the master plan, so when we look at our master plan in five years, we will be evaluating um, progress on it. However, the very first, uh, we're, we're starting to develop kind of the the, uh, outline of an implementation chapter for the master plan update because uh, we're trying to pull a draft together for you to review and then we can take it to the public. Um, the very first thing that we're suggesting is that we have a standing annual date for master plan review so that we're not waiting five years to, to talk about how much progress we've made. Um, I've been recommending this to every community I do a master plan for recently. You know, you basically you set aside your first meeting in September or whatever meeting you choose is your master plan review meeting. That's what you do at that meeting. It's probably not set up like this. It's probably set up more like we do in the community room where we have tables in a circle and we go through our master plan implementation items and we talk about how are we doing on these things? How does all this still feel relevant? have we made progress on any of these action items? And if we go through and we really haven't made progress on much, then we kind of get a sense of what our work to do is. Um, and if you do that annual review, um, a couple things that I've seen in other communities is, is that one, you do make a lot of progress because you're, you're holding yourself to account, right? And of course, the Planning Commission isn't going to be in charge of everything. So there are going to be some things that are kind of out of your hands, and we're going to have to find out from the responsible bodies, has, has progress been made on this? But then we can report that at that annual review. And then when we get to the five-year mark, we have a pretty good sense of how much progress we've made because we've been looking at it every year. And at the five-year review, we have a, a, a very strong sense of, all right, do we need to update things? Do we need to change things? Is there something that's missing from this plan? Is there another chapter we need to add to it? Um, and I just think that it's it's kind of, it's good master plan hygiene, I guess, to, yeah, to can, visit your master plan every year. Can I suggest maybe, um, maybe it's not a good idea, but, you know, we do a year-end review, and it would mm. seem like that might be a good time even the sure, meeting after yeah. or at that meeting to align. Because usually we have a list of what ordinances we've went through and yep. different things we've done, so it might be helpful to kind of maybe have those all together or Sure. I mean, next? I think if you, if you looked at your annual report, uh, in one meeting, and then your next meeting was the workshop where you all sit down and you do your annual master plan review. That would make a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, we, we First of all, we've just talked about, well, here's all the plans we approved last year or didn't approve. Um, and here's all the amendments that we did last year, and here's everything else that happened. Um, then we've got a good kind of frame of mind for going into that annual review. And... You know, so it might be that, you know, the first meeting in March or something is the most appropriate time to do it. Okay. Um, I actually like that idea a lot. 
And would they, would you guys do it as well? Does it trickle down? Does the sustainability also go through or no? Does that body remain intact? If that like, body remains in oh. for five years, I don't know. Uh, I, I didn't know that there was like an actual end yeah. date to you guys. I don't know. If, if that body remains intact, then yes, I think they probably would. Um, Have it, it to us by March, please. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where I signed up for. <laughs> But yeah, I mean that there there's kind of uh, going to be a discussion about do we try to really formalize this sustainability uh, committee and and have it continue into the future and can we get enough m consistent membership to to support that? Um, that's kind of what the discussion that needs to happen. Okay. Um, but um, yes, I do like um, I do really like the idea of doing the annual master plan review. Kind of the meeting after um, the annual report. It's fresh in our brains because it just yeah. it, it, it one flows right into the other. Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's very logical. Um, yeah. Uh, any any other comments now? Happy to hear them. Uh, but if not, then next time. And if you want to, if you find a typo, I'm sure there's a couple typos in here. Um, if you find a typo, just you know, mark it down and let us know by email or something. That's fine. Um, and you, we kind of touched on this briefly. In terms of the master plan, do we have an update on where we're at and like what upcoming workshops might be taking place? In the yeah, next 30, 60, 90 days. So we're we're we've we had the draft goals. Was that last meeting or the meeting before? It might have been the meeting before. I think it was the meeting before. Um, and so we've refined, we're refining those based on the feedback that we got from you. And uh, we are also working on the draft text for each of the subchapters. So I'd like to bring the goals back to you next time uh, and uh, kind of finish refining those and then draft text after that. Um, and once the planning commission, you probably will not get through all the draft text in one meeting. My guess is we'll talk about it for a couple of meetings. And once the planning commission is comfortable with that draft text, then we're on to setting up a workshop and giving the public a chance to respond to it. And um, then once the public has responded to it, the planning commission kind of regroups makes whatever changes it feels are necessary based on the response that you get, and then you're on to your, you know, uh, distribution of the plan for comment and um, ultimately your public hearing. <clears throat> All good? Yep. <clears throat> Anything under other business? Nope. Anything under planner's report? I do have one thing under planner's ah. report. So I uh, did not get the link to Nick in time for it to make it into your packet, but I did want to let you all know that um, uh, we, we had the STR discussion at the last meeting, and I owe you... Um, uh, a communication to council uh, for your approval, uh, which is being drafted. But I did want to let you all know that um, I think you're, most of you are aware that uh, in the previous legislature, there were house bills that had been introduced to preempt local authority over short-term rental units. Um, there is a new, in the current legislature bill, House Bill 5438, and I have a... Um, a uh, very brief summary of it from uh, the Michigan Municipal League uh, that I got from going to their capital convention um, last week. Uh, and I'll just read it to you because it's that brief. Um, it has been almost seven years since the first bill on short-term rentals was introduced in April 2017. It was a preemption amendment to the Michigan Zoning Enabling Act. Legislators were told by proponents it was needed because municipalities across the state were banning STRs. Since then, and this is the Michigan Municipal League uh, speaking, so this is their voice. Um, since then, we have fought off several attempts to remove local decision-making on the regulation of short-term vacation rentals in our communities. 
With every attempt to preempt local control, we've provided workable alternatives. This time, a different approach is being taken, and proactive legislation was recently introduced that would protect local decision-making. House Bill 5438 provides for the registry and regulation of short-term rentals and hosting platforms and is distinctly different from what we have seen in the past. House Bill 5438 does the following. Creates a statewide short-term rental database. So all of a sudden there would be a state resource that you can consult. Um, it's not a preemption. Uh, this is, again, MML's words, not a preemption attack on local decision-making. Uh, local units of government maintain authority to regulate STRs. It creates an STR excise tax. The rate is 6% of the occupancy charge, uh, with most of the proceeds going back to the municipality where the STR is located. And then it states that hosting platforms cannot facilitate a booking transaction for a short-term rental who's not in good standing with the applicable local unit of government. So... This is like a complete 180 degree mm -hmm. turn from the previous legislation that said you can't do anything, you just got to let them happen. So mm -hmm. I don't know if this is going to pass. I don't know if it's going to get signed into law, but I wanted you all to know that it's out there. And rather than preempting local authority, it kind of, it not only protects local authority, it also provides additional resources that were not there before. Uh, and if, if a if you do wind up with some of these units in your community or you, you choose to permit some of them, you actually get some sort of financial benefit for it um, in the form of the excise tax. But, so um, how far did that go? Was that, it, was that introduced to... It was introduced. I uh, believe it's still in committee. I don't think the House has voted on it in full at the moment, uh, but I expect that it's going to advance out of committee sometime soon. Do you know when it was introduced? Um, I believe in January. January, January okay. or February. February 20th. <laughs> oh, okay. There you go. All right. Thanks, thanks Nick. <laughs> so I, I did want to let you all know while you're awaiting that uh, communication to council that that is what's happening at the state level right now. I think it's interesting. I just, just started scanning it. It, it. it does outline or address some of the concerns we were talked about last meeting or the last time we talked about it and that, it, that short-term rentals well, should have a carbon monoxide detector, smoke detector, and fire extinguisher. <laughs> exactly. That was something that we specifically specifically talked about last yep. time. Yeah, it's it's um, again, it's very very different from the direction things were going just a couple years ago. So, I we'll see what happens with it. But um, at any rate, yeah, it, I think it's uh, it's going to be helpful. I haven't <clears throat> excuse me. I haven't any complaints about about our short term rentals. Uh, on St. Patrick's Day, I drove by the one on 14 miles for Cosmic Guardian Angels. Mm -hmm. Driveway was packed with cars. Was it? You know, so that somebody, oh, somebody rented it to come to Clawson to celebrate St. Patrick's they Day. They had to obviously. go to Gus's or something, maybe. But, uh, <laughs> but I haven't heard any complaints or from the neighbors or anybody else. So. Okay, uh, can we move on to a staff report and training opportunities? And just a quick correction. That was... February 13th and 14th is when it was introduced in the House. Sorry about that. Uh, so the first thing I just want to remind everyone is to uh, have the ethics disclosure form completed by April 15th. I believe most of you have done that, and so we do have one more meeting before that deadline. So I will make sure um, we have some hard copies available at that meeting so you can complete them afterwards if you don't have the ability to do that virtually from home or submit a hard copy. Um, additionally, as Joe alluded to, I believe we're looking to have some master plan related agenda items during our next uh, PC meeting. Uh, as well as that, we have the site plan for 502 South Main Street. Uh, we're likely going to have the capital improvement plan in front of you for your review. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the short-term rental uh, continued discussion. Uh, regarding developments, um, 905 West Maple was finally able to get their uh, certificate of occupancy. They finally were able to get the work done with their fire hydrant and the right of way off of Maple. And so uh, that was inspected by DPW and our building officials. So the CFO uh, is completed. And I would be happy to answer any other questions that the Planning Commission has on the report or any other general inquiries. Same question I've had for a while under the uh, wall height requirements. It still says a secondary review of the ordinance. 
regarding walls being reviewed by Gilfus and Rush. I'm hoping this doesn't fall by the wayside. I'd, we approved it in September, and I think all it needs is to go in front of mayor and council, have them say yes, and it becomes an ordinance then. Yeah, I believe at the time we, we thought that we were going to have a couple more ordinance amendments forthcoming. And, yeah, and so we were going to have, you know, do two or three at the same time. Uh, obviously, we haven't made that direction, so we'll probably just end up moving forward with that solo uh, zoning ordinance amendment. Yeah, I'd like to make sure that it does get passed by them so we don't get stuck again. Somebody else, at the last minute, somebody could come in and say, hey, we don't have to put up a six-foot wall. So that's the only, uh, that's the only thing I have. Anybody else? Anything? Uh, yeah, I have a question. I um, I have not gotten a single email from a resident. I don't know. Maybe maybe they're not emailing. Um, but uh, do you normally? <laughs> I mean, yes. Before we would, especially during a PUD, we would definitely. I haven't gotten an email from a resident in probably over a year. Oh well. I guess you're not as cool. But um, I'm just wondering if, I'm joking, Greg. Um, I'm just wondering if it's the new platform. Um, I know you mentioned something before about the Microsoft. Can you go over that? I mean, is anybody else feeling like they're struggling, like they might be missing emails, or is it just me? Because I'll do a, no, a separate No, how easy it is for a resident to find us. It's not that simple, really, to go on the city page. And you used to be able to pull it out. And you can find it, but it's not readily available as far as I'm concerned. Well, I'm just worried that it's um, taking my emails and putting them somewhere and so I'm not getting seeing Getting stuck it. in the cloud or something? Or filtering out from trash or something. I don't know. Spam? So uh, I believe it was last meeting or the meeting before I kind of out outlined what that quarantine report is. Quarantine, yeah. And so that report comes in daily and it just it, it is essentially a filter on your email that, that intends to block spam uh, risk phishing emails. And it's you know typically 99% accurate pulling emails. I have yet to find an email that I was supposed to get that got stuck in there most of the time. It's spam, sales, pitches, stuff like that. Um, so I, I would recommend looking at the quarantine report. How you do you pull that up? It should just go to your general mailbox mm -hmm. in your email. There'll be a drop right down on the quarantine report. Oh, yeah. so there's not like a folder with all my quarantine reports? No, it'll come into your just general inbox. No, I mean, I have, but I didn't, I thought it would be like a folder. I was looking for a folder to find all my quarantine report emails. No, you have There's to like release them if you want them to actually hit your inbox. Otherwise, it's like a general report that's automated, sent to your inbox once a week or whatever it is. And it'll say everything that was quarantined that was never delivered. Okay. So you'd have to hit release if it's the same way as my work outlook. <laughs> That's correct. Yeah. But okay. I haven't had any yet. Um, you have to release. Okay. And so nobody else is getting responses from residents. Um, well, you know, in past years, we've gotten lots of emails. Um, we got a lot. And then all of a sudden, when the PUD across the street at Roth came in, I know residents were emailing us and we weren't getting them yeah. for a while. And I was told that they changed our initials or something on the city page. Are, are they G easily Cacera, accessible? It is, it is on the website under the Planning Commission. So if you go to the cityclawson.com, uh, our government planning commission, um, it lists all of our planning commissioners, and uh, there is an area where you can see, click here to share your thoughts with the planning commission, and then you can send an email to all yeah. the entire body. We'll have to try it. Well, and I'm wondering if there's ways that we can make it more accessible and... Well, we got pronounced. a new guy, right? We got a new guy hired on that's going to yeah. take care of all this for us. Yes, he is working on doing uh, renovating the website, improving our communications. Uh, and so I don't know if you follow us on Facebook, any of our other social medias. We've definitely had a lot more contact, content coming out, and I think we're, we're really excited and trending in the right direction for uh, engaging with the community. I think it's going to be a really massive benefit for for everyone in Clawson. Would we um, be able to request an, like a, a, a larger like email the Planning Commission um, or s something on that page that if it's a little hyperlink that I'm thinking, um, that's probably one, hard to find, and two, d does it really even say, like do they even know what that means? Like <laughs> are they, can we have an email button or something there? Yeah, I think there's, there's ways we can improve that. <laughs> Do we have to put it through by uh, vote, or can we just leave it with you now? I could probably do it before we end the meeting, but I won't. Oh, but. oh. all right. Well, not like that. Sorry. I, oh, oh. It's, it's a simple <laughs> fix. It's not okay. something that's you know going to take a ton of time. Okay. So 
I, I think there's just ways. There's there's things on the website that have been that way forever. Mm -hmm. um, just like I mean, any any website, any entity. And so that's the good thing with um, Brandon is a gentleman's name who joined our team. Uh, he'll be able to monitor a lot of that stuff. And there there are a handful of dead links that you know I'll find from 2017. And it's just because uh, no one on staffs noticed it. No one from the public has started, shared anything. Uh, and so, you know, renovating the website, I think, will will help make things a lot much more clear for the public. Okay. I'd definitely like to see the calendar updated because if you go to the City of Clawson calendar, I get a blank calendar there with absolutely nothing posted on it oh. as to when council oh. meetings are, our meetings, ZBA meetings. I don't know, how do you people know that we have a meeting? <laughs> so if you didn't know yeah. when the dates are, you have to go to the city page and hit and miss, you know, as to... That's something we've realized as well, and, and what we're working on doing is having a banner run across the top of our website that has um, three to five key things, uh, yeah. you know, trash days postponed, city council meeting coming up, stuff like that. Yeah. And so if you go to our homepage, you're, you view like a couple drop downs and then just a, a big picture. And so it's, it doesn't have the most user friendly uh, look. I don't think we need a full redesign whatsoever, and Brandon, who has experience in this, doesn't it just needs some love and attention, and so we're working on that. And so, uh, as you, uh, if you go on the website, notice any problems regarding planning commission or just general things, please send them my way, and we'll get them updated as fast as we can. Yeah, I'd just like to make us more accessible if we could. Thanks. Okay, we have no legal update tonight because we have no lawyer. He went home early. Uh, does anybody else have any comments? Otherwise, I'll bring a motion to adjourn. <laughs> I'll make a motion to um, uh, close. Adjourn. Adjourn, sorry. <laughs> Postpone. <laughs> support. Motion support. Uh, roll call, please. Post postpone adjournment. <laughs> Mr. Colburn? Yes. Mr. Cusera? Yes. Mr. Nushai? Yes. Ms. Redman? Uh, yes. Mr. Solomon? Yes. Mr. Tinlin? Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mr. Fitzer? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone.